good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that aims at shedding the light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of this country and on Black excellence. To talk about Black excellence, we are going to uh, have a, an intimate uh, discussion about American Rot, a play which I recently saw and just concluded its run at the experimental La Mama Theater in the village. It's an incredible play that took me on a roller coaster of emotions. And we are going to talk about this play with Kate Tani Billingsley, who is act an actress, playwright, and teaching artist at the Actor Studio Drama School where she received her MFA and she is the winner of the Theater Hall of Fame's 2018 Emerging Art Artist Grant. And she is the playwright, the lyricist, and the co-composer of American Rock. Welcome to My Harlem Portraits. Thank you for having me. And Mr. Count Stowell who is actor, director, producer, teacher, writer, and lecturer. He has performed in film, daytime and nighttime television, and he has performed in 133 plays over 56 years of his career, of which some on Broadway, some very incredible one on Broadway, and I just name a few, A Streetcar Named Desire, Driving Miss Daisy, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Innocent Black. And he is the lead actor in this amazing play. Welcome both to my Harlem portrait. Thank you. It's good to be here. And uh, uh, Count is also the first person I interviewed at the first episode of this show, 146 or 149 episodes ago. So welcome back to the show, Count. <laughs> well, it's nice to be back. I've been waiting my turn patiently. <laughs> I've been waiting my turn to get back at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, this play is about your ancestor, Chief Justice Roger Tanney. And a decision, and the majority opinion, he took and read in 1857. That decision modified the course of history and moved the nation closer to the Civil War. Tell us a little bit about that. And to count after her, you play the descendant of Dred Scott, who is the enslaved Black man who in 1846 sued for his freedom against the decision. So to both of you, tell us about the circumstances of this play. So Roger Brooke Taney was a man who was born on a tobacco plantation who uh, was descended from slave owners who uh, in later in his life and still as a young man manumitted the people that he owned and he uh, defended an abolitionist uh, a preacher. He did all of these little things that sort of spoke to perhaps um, his empathy for the enslaved. And then in 1857, he writes the Dred Scott decision, which was a brutal and the most infamous decision in Supreme Court history, uh, which damned uh, black people you know, to chattel slavery and said that they were not citizens and therefore could not sue for their right for anything. Uh, and so this was a, a, a shame in my family that I grew up with. And it was something that I wanted to explore, uh, sort of what is inherited shame and, and how do white people um, deal with the legacy of our ancestors uh, being slave owners, murderers, rapists, uh, colonizers, et cetera, and how that speaks to where we are at today in our country. 
I mean, the show was so amazing because it really took you to every single emotion that the person can have, even being on the outside. And I, when I saw you, and I saw you were a white woman who wrote <laughs> this piece, I couldn't believe it because I felt that you really touched everything. So I'm gonna ask, but I am not black. So I'm gonna ask Count, uh, how did it fit in the, I mean, I asked him before, you are, you play the descendant of the person who sued. So tell us about the plot and tell us what you think about the way that Kate did this play. Because to me, but seen from a different point of view. Well, um, from a different point of view, I've been with the play for a number of years and a, and a couple of incarnations. I think it's a brilliant play. I think her first incarnation, it was only a two character play, a descendant of Dred Scott and a dis descendant of Roger Brooke Tawney uh, met at a, at a diner and it was just uh, a two hander. And we ended up um, doing it at the actor studio. We filmed it eventually. And it uh, was a 28 minute piece. And now she has expanded it uh, to 14 characters uh, and having a black chorus uh, representing ev everybody uh, on Dred Scott's side and a white chorus representing everybody on, on um, Roger Brooke Tawney's side, his wife, his daughter, et cetera. And, and uh, we have the same thing on, on the, the Black uh, Chorus's side. It was a very enjoyable piece because it's now very abstract and uh, there's an awful lot, lot of um, presentational uh, performances that were going on. So instead of being simple, organic, uh, two men talking over a table, over a cup of coffee, you get to hear all of the background and you get to see Dred Scott and you get to see uh, the, the the ghost of, of Chief Justice Roger Brook Tawney putting their input in. And I think it's, a, it's just a, a marvelous way to, to deal with that history. You know, the history goes back 167 years and here we are in 2024 uh, dealing with two men. Uh, one is a uh, tenured professor at uh, UVA and he's um, he's a constitutional um, uh, professor, and the uh, the other uh, they're both basically as as uh, we were told uh, intellectuals, uh, scholars of of some sort, um, and they're debating a, a bit of should the apology uh, suffice uh, from the Tawney family to the Scott family, and should it um, somehow be. Um, uh, a little bit um is is it from the scott side uh, efficient or is it sufficient and i think that um that debate that goes back and forth and you're seeing the opinions of of, of his family both families uh entering into it uh i thought that was that, that was you know quite uh, a great piece of dramaturgy and and a wonderful piece of playwriting i totally agree with that i I loved it. Yeah. So my second question, which in a sense you answered already, Kate, was what compelled you to write this play? And for Count, how did you get involved in this play? Well, uh, what compelled me to write the play was uh, I was working on a play by Miri Baraka called Dutchman. And I'm a method actor. And so my job is to really investigate my own psyche and behavior. And so I was playing a white supremacist. I was playing Lula. And so I was confronted with a lot of uh, inherent biases that I think I had, I was not aware of that were completely unconscious. And so the more that I excavated that, the more stuff came up. And then I sort of sat down to write this dramatic question of should our family apologize to the Scott family because it was a question that my father brought up uh, growing up and I thought it was a great dramatic question and I wanted some form of protest and I felt that um, it was 
using my gifts as an artist to be able to put that pen to paper. And I had no idea how it would end. And it was, I was terrified to write it. Um, but I'm, I'm so happy that I did because it was um, a healing process. This entire, uh, the 10 years that I've been writing it and certainly the last few weeks uh, seeing Count do this work and the other actors and Estelle working on it um, has just been so, uh, uh, it, it has been painful, but it's also been so beautiful. So I'm, I'm so grateful to Count who is magnificent in this play. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And uh, how did you get involved, Count, in this play? Um, I was fortunate enough to work with um, the, the, the wonderful actress, director, Estelle Parsons, in several projects at the Actors Studio previously. And when... Uh, the part came available. Uh, I was asked some years ago, would I uh, join the the duo uh, to read or or to um, look at the the script? And um, Kate and and Estelle were kind enough to allow me me to to work on the piece with them. And uh, we started out, as I said before, some years ago, doing a two character play and a, a very short play. And so um, that was my first uh, introduction to Roger Brooke Tawney and Dred Scott. How did you feel about this play, Count? When you first read it, what did you think about this? Because it's this a wonderful a play, opportunity. Really it's a wonderful opportunity to do uh, one of the great roles of my Oh, over five decade career, uh, because <clears throat> it required such concentration and such um, focus. The 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 play, as it is in this incarnation, as I say, fourteen characters, it really moves. It moves very quickly, and yeah. trying to stay engaged. Whereas the first two two character piece, you could kind of relax. And you could uh, mm, ah, and and find your, yourself thinking or breathing in a certain way. This was more like Shakespeare. This was more like like you cannot, you don't have the time mm. to um, sit there and wait for anything. You've got to move it. You've got to pick up the cues. You've got to be completely focused all the time. Yeah. And the challenge was that you were going through an emotional journey, but you're going through an intellectual journey as well. And that pace and that drive and that execution of it really challenged me. And, and I'm not a, a, a young man anymore. Um, and I think that that also added, I mean, my age also added to, to, the, um, to the difficulty of it. So I, I love and I hate all of everybody uh, for, uh, making me work so hard. I, I just <laughs> really, really, uh, uh, I didn't struggle with it, but I was mindful of, okay, stay with it. Don't don't lose focus for a moment because it'll go right by you. They use the image of a train and it felt like I was sometimes standing on the track and the train was coming at me, you know? So I, but I enjoyed it for the most part I, I love the fact that I still have some chops left and I, I can still do the work. And um, I love the fact that, that, that Kate and Estelle were pleased by the result and the audience seemed to be very pleased by the result as well. But it was, it was very taxing, very difficult. It, it was not uh, easy whatsoever. The material itself was just brilliant, just wonderful. I've never been able to articulate these thoughts about you know, racial um, uh, point uh, points of view, and I was never able to have the, these this debate uh, before, and uh, this play allowed it. Uh, you know, in a way that I never had in in my entire career. So I, I congratulate Kate and Estelle and the entire cast for all that that they were able to accomplish with it, because it it was just not an easy journey, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It's one of the most monumental questions of our time in, in terms of America 
this difference between race and and uh, who loves who, who hates who. Uh, Native American um, uh, character was in, in there. And um, that background, I mean, we had everything except uh, Japanese internment camps, you know. <laughs> so it was, it's, it's quite an amazing piece. It covers a, a huge bit of history and it makes the audience feel a great deal. Many people came to me and talked about how much they were in tears and uh, we on stage were in tears and they in the audience were in tears. So yeah. it's, 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 a great, it's a great piece and one, one which I really hope has a tremendous future and moves around the country so that an awful lot of people can see it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, both you, you are answering as we go to all the questions that I've been preparing because this piece from the audience point of view has got all you said count, all these uh, continuous flashes of very, very, very important information that are sent at you and you need to grab them and you need to later on elaborate what you went through because it's so deep and so important what you did, Kate. It's amazing. I really, I really was mesmerized and everybody else in the public and you saw it because it was standing ovation and and count as far as the public is concerned you didn't give the impression that it was so difficult for do to you <laughs> to do for you so <laughs> it was impeccable you were as impeccable ever as i've always seen you in your plays and in your interpretation of anything, so. Well, as I told told Kate uh, later, she would talk about you know, the work. I say you have to have the role. At one point, I covered James Earl Jones in um, uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof on Broadway, <laughs> and then James uh, fell ill and was out for three weeks. I was playing a a, a smaller role called Doctor Ba, who gave him the morphine in the play at one point, uh, well, throughout, actually. And then when James fell ill, I went in and took over the role of Big Daddy. Well, after the play is over, there are people out by the stage door looking for autographs and congratulating you. Well, they never did that when I was just playing Dr. Ba. So as <laughs> I told Kate, it's the role. The role is everything. If If you do a role that has a great deal to offer, a great deal to say, and the audience identifies with it, uh, they will compliment you. Yeah. But if you do a, a different role of the doorman or whatever, uh, they will say, oh, uh, you you were in the play? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was there. Oh, oh, I, uh, that, that, that was nice, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's the it's the writer, I call her the the creator. She I told told her that I, I uh, as count and as as the character Walter Scott, I, I I fell in love with the Creator. It's like you 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 understand why human beings love God so much and are trying to find their version of whatever the divine is. Because in this case, Kate is the the Creator, and and I went back to the Creator with tremendous amount of gratitude and appreciation and affection for for she would heap the work and say oh you did good but i said well you created me you know and and in creating me you gave me the opportunity to explore and go on this journey so i have tremendous amount of respect and and appreciation and love for for kate uh, as my creator and it was just i mean i I did everything but want to sit out there in the audience and watch the piece myself. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so, Kate, we we have been talking about this is this is based on the situation in America, which is a very special place. I've lived in many different countries in my life, at least ten, and I've never felt the uh, the question of race as as relevant as it is here 
And in a sense, I don't understand it. I understand it, but I don't understand because as far as I'm concerned, there is no races. There is one race. It's a human race. And so everything else is really based on the fact that there are different ethnic and uh, and uh, uh, cultures and so on, but there are no different races. But you received, Kate, the National Judicial College's Award for Justice and Service and the Alex Haley Award for Race and Reconciliation. So it, the responsibility you feel to be a descendant of Chief Justice Tenney obviously has influenced your life a lot. And this play is a clear evidence of it. Tell us how this path, how this quest for the tooth, how difficult this has been for you. Well, uh, racism and more so white supremacy is our nation's uh, national shadow. Yeah. And it is how we were founded. Uh, you know, white people, we came to the Americas and we uh, immediately started taking over the land and killing people and saying, this is ours now. And then we started bringing people from Africa across the seas into America and said, you are ours now and you will do what we say and et cetera. And became this money-making capitalist machine mm -hmm. off of human bodies. And so if that is the roots, speaking of Alex Haley, the roots of our nation, mm -hmm. then is it no wonder that I call the play American Rot? Because 400 years later, here we are, and we are still battling this stuff that's inside of us. And so I found that to be um, so disturbing to me when I did finally sort of see, was aware of um, my own part in white supremacy and uh, my own innate racism that would come through like out of nowhere. And I would be, what? You know, so to once there's a facing of it, an acknowledgement of it. And now it's like, you know, I, I always say about this play, when people ask me this question about how I dealt with it, black people since the beginning of chattel slavery have this tireless oppression. I mean, the tiredness is something in terms of my research and how many people I've spoken to and listened to, like, this is, this is relentless in terms of the, the, the exhaustion of having to deal with oppression. And so when I think of like how tired it makes me to constantly be aware of when those things are coming through to, with my own part in white supremacy, it's tiring to, to have the awareness of it and keep confronting it. But it's not half as tiring as having to deal with the oppression of prejudice and racism in this country. And so if more white people were willing to not just write letters of apology or, you know, uh, talking about what, when George Floyd died, all every single institution across the country, well, not everyone, but most, especially liberal and progressive ones were speaking about, um, you know, oh, this is this is what we're going to do to combat racism. But was any of that stuff actually done? And are white people really willing to give up power, money, opportunity so that black people can have more and thrive? Um, and so that's and it's something that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be working on. And I think there's a trap in this piece here where, you know, as much as I feel so much love and grace coming from people, that there's this white savior thing that happens, right? So I so I kept saying, like, I wish I could just not ever be in front of the play. I wish I could always be behind the play as the playwright um, and sort of be faceless. But I think it's important that um, I speak on it, too, and that I am a Tawny and I am white. And to I want to also acknowledge, like, anything that is in my play, everything that is in my play that is 
worthwhile, that is impactful, that is important, has probably come from a person of color yeah. that I have listened to, that I have read, that I've collaborated with, um, that it's now just as a playwright about receiving information and then sorting it through my imagination onto paper. Yeah, I totally, totally understand. Well, it's, I mean, if every white person in America was like you, we would not be in the situation we are right now. So it's, as far, you're amazing. I think you're amazing too, because it's a very big responsibility and a very ugly responsibility that you have decided to take on yourself. You, you went, you didn't have to do that. So, especially being in this country. So thank you for doing that because I think it's incredible. I understand you, the white sable thing. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think out about the white sable thing? Oh, I think she done saved all of us, and I feel so good about it. Oh, <laughs> happy days. Lord have mercy. Zippity doo dah. I think we need to all get up and sing and uh, do a little march down the street. <laughs> Uh, act, act, act. We are making <laughs> her cry. Oh no! Uh, no, That's fantastic. I, I tell you, one of the things that you understand from the 21st century perspective is that it's not easy to go back and mine all of that history. I have been a, a teacher, a college teacher, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for many, many years. And working with, with young people and working with, with, with adults, uh, you find that people are loath to go back into the history. They think 1619, that 1619 project, oh, that's ancient history. Jan Jamestown, you know, Virginia, that's ancient history. We don't have slavery anymore. But the one thing that we do have is repression and oppression. And that kind of repression, you don't understand it unless you're completely immersed in it. You don't understand the benefits that you receive, the legacy benefits that you receive from skin color. You don't understand how these people devised it. As you say, you've been around the world, you've, you've gone to various countries, and they didn't have this kind of white black business. They had you know, if you were a, a Greek, you were Greek. If you were Italian, you were Italian. If you were Russian, you're Russian. But the reality is, at one point in um, history, human history, it benefited certain people to say, we are Anglo-Saxon Protestant, we are white Anglo, and we are white, and you are not. You are subservient to us. And it became a myth that became a reality that everybody participated in. At one point, if you were English or you were French in America, you were fine. If you were a Pole, if you were Italian, if you were Greek, if you were Slo Slo uh, uh, you know, from Slo uh, Slovakia, or something, you were not fine. So you were not considered part of the power structure or part of being a part of the white race. And little by little, they included everybody except Africans and, and Adivasis who came from India. But the reality is everybody started to share in the myth and everybody participated in it to an extent where if I could pass, if I was very, very fair skinned, then I would pass for white. You know? and, it, and it's a struggle. But the idea is that history, people want to pretend, how does it affect me? I never had any slaves. I never did this. I never did that. But the people who are subjected to going in for an audition or or a job interview, my daughters, my sons, you know, they're affected by the first thing somebody says. You go to a police station. It was a black man that did this. It was a black woman that did that. They see color first. Yeah. And that seeing color first is is it, somebody said, well, the way to get rid of it is you we have to ignore it. You know, we have to just not, we think of ourselves as human beings, et cetera. Well, it's very difficult, even multiracial people. I'm, I'm the father of two beautiful uh, Afro-Poles, 
as I, we call them. My wife is Polish. My my daughters are, are half me and half them. But still, the first thing, you got one drop of African blood in you, you're considered a black girl. You're a black girl. Well, she's a black girl, isn't she? Or is she is she Mexican or is she Indian? What is she? She's they, they know she they're everything except they're not white, but their mother is considered white, and they are not. And it's 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 still going on to this day. So that kind of pressure and that kind of trying to live up to it, you know, I mean, when when the when the policeman grabs going for his taser or going for her taser, grabs her gun and shoots somebody, she says, oops, I'm sorry, but the man is dead and there's nothing you can do about it. But she went there out of fear. Oh, 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 oh my God. Look, uh, uh, it, they're not afraid when they see people that they identify with, but this lack of identification with people is just basic human. There's a man, there's a, there's a, a young man committing a crime or a young woman committing a crime and but they see the race first and that that that's very painful here in 2024 yeah yeah yes and that's something that i have few friends who have uh, an italian mother and a black father or the other way around and french father and it a black mother or whatever. And when I first arrived in this country and they told me I'm black and I say, why do you say you're black when your mother is Italian or your father is French? So you are half and half. You have his or her heritage too. And that's what they told me. Well, if you have 164 of black in your, in your uh, you are considered black. And I said, yeah, but this is a brainwashing from the white people. <laughs> that you shouldn't accept, right? Because you are giving up my race, like you're giving up my 50% that is Italian. You, you're you not talking about your mom who was Italian. You're only talking about your dad. What about your 50% Italian? You're giving that up. Who is telling you that you're supposed to give it up? So that was or, my- or, or to whose advantage is, is it for you to, you to be in the conundrum in the first place? Who does it help? You know, that's right. So, I mean, you it, uh, uh, what what we can see it very clearly. I mean, one of the clearest examples, not only of going back to the beginnings when there were 500 different Native American tribes here uh, on, on the continental United States, but we can see it very clearly when, when the Japanese internment camps occurred and the Japanese Americans were no longer Americans. Uh, to, to the majority, they were just Japanese, potential, you know, spies and infiltrators. So we had to incarcerate them. And we just happened to have to take all their land and all their property. Yeah. Okay, we are really near to the end. We don't want to be cut off. So I'm going to ask you, uh, Kate, what do you hope the play moves to next and how do you intend to go about that? And count also. Well, I'm I'm hoping the play uh, could move to another theater in New York, potentially. Um, we are talking to different producers to see what our opportunities might be to do that. Um, and then there's also this sort of, what I would love is a grassroots movement to get this play popping up in different regional theaters around the country because you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm saying in this play, New Yorkers have probably already heard before, um, but that many people around the country either haven't or don't want to talk about. But I think this play is a great entryway into a conversation about racism and that what I think the thing that most people walk away with that I've heard is like, I went and talked about this for the rest of the night. I woke up the next morning and I wanted to talk to my friends about it and what came up for me. So that, if that dialogue can begin, then there's this ripple effect. And that to me would be ideal to, for as many people to see it as possible, just so that people could start talking really honestly in courageous ways about race. And this would be incredible if it happened right now, because right now, before these elections, this is so fundamental because we have a white supremacist who has been indicted in so many counts that is still running for president. Yep. How is that possible? Yep. 
And that and half the country uh, voted into office in the last election or the, you know, one before this. Well, even before, I mean, even in the last one, it was way too close. Yeah. Well, and so you know that half the country is leaning that way. It's a little it's more than a little terrifying. It's 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 the it's the fragility of our country is yeah. on this. It's unbelievable. Coming from Europe is just the, it's not half of the country, by the way. It's three well, thousand fifty million people, which is nothing. Okay. Because in this country, there are the 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 people who vote is a very reduced percentage compared right. to what in other countries. Yeah, correct. Right. Right, so yeah. it's only fifty million, but it's fifty million too many. Yeah, that's exactly. the problem. <laughs> the problem. So we need this play to go around now as soon as possible around in the Midwest and in the South. That's where it needs to go to wake up people, count. Well, the dialogue <laughs> that takes place after the play, uh, the play engenders hope in some people, confusion in others, and it inspires others to speak. But once you get a chance to be in a, a wonderful dialogue, the play is only, a, it's between, it's less than 70 minutes in terms of the tightness of, of the performance, if it goes well. And that tight 70 minutes gives us an awful lot of time to see each other as audience and actors and performers and writer and talk. And the conversation that, that Kate has enabled us to start is, is very, very important. And I think that this is what we have to do. This is what the play does. The play have... starts a dialogue and starts people thinking and starts people ruminating about, about who they are, what their opinions are, about all the issues that she raises. And she raises quite a few very, very important oh. issues in the play. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of it. I hope it has as amazing future and I'll do whatever I, I can do to participate or to contribute to it. Thank you. And I have to thank you here because it's gonna stop in a few seconds. Thank you for this incredible conversation and a lot of wishes for this to happen and to go everywhere. Thank you so much for having me on here. Thank you, Kate, for what you did. And thank you, Stovall Count, for what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to my viewers. See you next Saturday, 12.30 on Spectrum. If not on my Harlem portraits on my YouTube channel, you can see all the past episodes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.